Salutations, everybody. Welcome back to Victoria 3. I'm Lord Formant, and here we're going to be talking about the economy, mainly trade. So I've already done another guide video on basic trade buildings and everything else. This time we're going to dive a little deeper into how trade works and why it's important that you not neglect it, unless you're playing someone like Isolationist Japan. And if this video does help you in any way, please do leave a like, a comment, and subscribe. And uh, we're going to jump right into this, but I will mention the video should be divided into several chapters. So if there's a topic that you already know and don't want to see again, or you just want to see it again, uh, they should be chapter below, so you can simply jump to what you need. The reason I mention that is this first section here will be talking about the basic concepts behind a trading market. And if you kind of already didn't know that, well, is, this is basically Economy 101 class for you. So every good in this game is produced and it is sold in a variety of markets. And we'll talk more about markets later. But in any market, there's a demand and there's a supply of a resource. So if we click here, you will see that grain in particular is being bought by 794 population. Uh, basically, it's got buyers, not population. 794, and we're selling 717. There is, in fact, a shortage of the amount of wheat, or sorry, grain being sold in this market compared to what is being bought. And you can do this and look around anywhere in the world to try and find exactly what's going on. And it fluctuates based off the changing pops, buildings, and trade routes, which we'll talk more about later. So, so why does this matter? So any resource you create is sold on a market. It is produced, it is shipped to the market, and if there is a interest in it, it is sold. Otherwise, it's pretty much basically lost. There's no stockpile in this game like there was in Victoria 2. Uh, it's just not really sold and that can have ripple effects further on down your economy for example if we find a building here like this arms industry at the start of the game it's losing money the reason it's losing money is the stuff that it's selling is not profitable for the business so it's got a negative weak knee balance because if we look at the artillery it's selling the artillery it's selling it compared to the base price of it all artillery is cheap meaning Selling artillery makes the building the building and the people working there small amounts of money. Or the other option is that the resource that go into it, say in this case hardwood, is more expensive than in what it would be if supply and demand equal. So in economy, there are two lines. There's a supply line and then there is a demand line. And without getting into the very complex rules of economy, Supply and demand at some point are equal, and uh, if they're not equal, weird things happen. So let's move forward a little bit here. Hopefully we can get a nice price change so I can show you what happens. So right here, we've got the price. If not enough is being sold, the price is going to go up. Um, if it is sold, it will go down. The red line here is the base price what it should be, the yellow line is what it is currently, and it's currently 8% above the base. Reason this matters is if you're buying a resource to give to your pops, you ideally want the costs to be low or your inputs to be low, but you want your outputs, as in, in this case, cannons and guns, to be expensive. If a business loses money, their cash reserves drain out, their owning pops no longer give dividends or anything and uh, people don't work there anymore if a building is positive it will hire people it will pay out wages the wages go into a person's pocket and then get paid depending on your laws into your investment pool it's a giant circle because that money is then by taxed by you and then used to build more buildings or buy or import resources to then give to your pops to make more money it's a very complex system Suffice to say that if a building is not making money, it's either because this stuff you're producing is not valuable enough or the stuff you're buying isn't cheap. It's expensive. 
And there are multiple ways of handling that. And that's where we start to get into the next topic, that of markets. And there are a vast variety of markets in the world. Um, somewhere there's a market page. So um, every nation in the game belongs to either its own market or a different market if it's part of a customs union or otherwise. So if we look here, you'll see the Russian market is huge. doesn't mean it's profitable, but the Prussian market, it actually incorporates almost all the little German states in here, which if they weren't part of the Prussian market would have their own, um, their own markets. And despite us being Belgium, we have our own little market compared to the Dutch and the French. Now you can join a larger market, but it does make you as a subject of them, although you don't pay resources, but you're still considered a subject in some other methods. So it might not be worth doing. And if you look at all these various lines, these are the resources being sold and bought from this market at the time. And it tells us where we're buying and selling stuff. Right now we're doing a lot of trade with the British market and only a little bit with the French and a little bit with the Germans. I don't even know if we actually start, you start the game trading with America. You don't. So suffice to say, markets are a very important concept because it, one good in a market, and there's no really easy way to show all this, a good in a particular market may be cheaper than a good in your land, or it might be more expensive due to various productions, factories, or even events. Therefore, you need to take advantage of those changes in markets Assuming you can trade with other countries, I'm looking at you, Shogunate Japan, who's the only nation that uh, historically kind of cut itself off and yet became a major power. Um, and that's where we get into the concepts of imports and exports. But before we move on, the market is a very important thing. And if you do a trading agreement with another country, um, the game doesn't fully explain it what a trade agreement is and i wish it did a little bit better but basically what it does is a trade agreement gets rid of tariffs between the two countries as in you can't put a tariff on their goods they can't put a tariff on yours and well and this is where things get slightly more confusing the bureaucracy cost goes down every trade route costs bureaucracy import and export and there are ways to modify and change that over time. Trade agreements can be good. It tends to have the AIs or you be able to trade into a market better, meaning out, people outside the market have to pay tariffs to buy in and out, whereas you don't. The downside is if, for example, we're Belgium and we signed a trade agreement with, say, the Qing, who at the start of the game tend to produce a massive, over-excessive amount of grain. If we were to open the trade market to them, it would be worth us buying grain from their market. But if they started selling grain in our market, they could easily crash the grain price in our market, thereby causing our, um, our wheat farms here to start going bankrupt and not making money, which could be a problem then if for some reason we stopped trading with them, the costs might be out of control for a while. So just be aware, trade agreements are great if you need money, or you need an influx of cheap goods, but could be a problem if you're trying to defend your um, your resources and everything else. Now, you can put tariffs on goods. At the beginning, there's a tariff on most goods, depending on what your trade policy is, and that's a whole law thing. Suffice to say, we have mercantilism, so we tax imports at a 15%, um, which tariffs aren't necessarily a good thing. They tend to cost you money, but they also get you some money. It's They change the supply and demand point, and I'm not going to get into that anymore because people who are not economists are probably lost. Um, now, tariffs also can be put on exports. They make you some more money as well. You can alter this to focus more on exports, meaning that, or sorry, imports in this case. If you import something, there's a tariff on it. It tends to protect your industry a little bit. On the other side, or sorry, this encourages exporting rather than importing. And over here, you can protect the domestic supply, meaning to export it costs more money, meaning that your pops are less likely to sell resources abroad, more likely to keep it local and domestic. 
whereas this is the opposite. They're more likely to sell it abroad. You can do this per good. It's a very advanced thing. If you're going to have a good that's really cheap in your market that you want to sell elsewhere, encouraging exports is not a bad thing. But you also then have to move into setting up import and exports routes. And so let's talk a little bit about that. So if we go to the trade routes for our Belgium market, you'll see up top it says goods with considerable import demand, goods with a considerable potential for exports, as well as if you have any unproductive trade routes, almost 100% of the time you want to cancel those. Down here are all the different resources, and it tells you that we have one trade route. Unfortunately, I've not found a way to easily see all of these in a row. You kind of have to go through each one and check it out. That's the way it goes. Now, you can start by also doing it down here through the trade lens. I prefer to do it through the market. It's just a matter of preference. And we're going to talk about import first. So up here, it says furniture. This means in our market, furniture is more expensive than abroad, meaning if we import goods, we will make uh, we will lower the cost of furniture in our market, thereby potentially improving our population standard of living, as well as if we were using furniture in another thing, which we wouldn't. So let's look at tools. We would use it in all of these things. It could decrease the production cost of the, say, a textile mill. It would cost less for the building to buy tools to make textiles therefore hoping that they can sell it at a greater profit. Again, this is something you need to keep an eye on, but it means if we don't correct this tool's demand, it's potential that all of these buildings here will not be profitable in our country. Um, now we could also correct it by building a tool factory in our land, but that's a little bit later in terms of manipulating your market. So suffice to say, if we click on tools, these are where we can import tools from in the world. And depending on where you want to import from, there's different levels of productivity. In this case, it tells us that to import any of it would cost us money due to pretty much tariffs. When we import it, we would make trade revenue of seven and then there would be a tariff of 60. So it's not actually worth to import tools here. It still doesn't mean that our tools aren't costing us money. It's just not worth importing them. If we click on grain, however, you'll see the British market here. It is to our benefit to import um, grain. It says predicted trade new, trade revenue. And in case you're wondering where trade revenue comes from, it comes from your trading uh, building in your um, various areas. So if we import this, it will automatically set up a trade route between the lands, and it will theoretically lower the cost of grain in our lands. Now, remember, there is this convoy pool, and you have to have convoys to actually trade. So let's look at furniture. Well, we can sort by productivity and import it from the British, but it will cost us. It's a level one trade route, um, and it costs us 15, or it will import 15 furniture, and it will cost us seven convoys. Now, each, co each trade route, of course, costs us bureaucracy, but you're never going to really make a country profitable just importing stuff unless you've got an immense economy that can support it. The reality is you've got to export stuff. So let's look at fertilizer. So fertilizer for us is extraordinarily cheap compared to the world. However, it's not a very expensive good, but we can sell it to the Dutch to the north. And obviously tariffs are taken into account. They hurt our incomes and stuff. But if we had a trade agreement with say like the British, it might be worth doing. But, um, so let's sell some to the Dutch. So what this means is level one, 10, does not require any convoys because it's a land route. If you happen to be in a landlocked country, great. You can trade pretty much as much as you want because you don't need convoys. If you're a sea-based nation, you might find yourself running out of convoys. You can increase that by changing your ports production or building more ports, which is almost always a good thing. So just like that, we've exported fertilizer to the Bel from the Belgian market to the Dutch. It's predict predicted to main at level one. And if you want to know how it will grow, um, here's the details on that. Number of goods traded would not increase. Okay, if we were able to sell more, trade out will not grow to level two because it's trade revenue after tariffs would decrease and be below eight. 
Basically, if a trade route is more profitable, the trade route will grow, you will keep selling more resources, and you will make more money from it. If it is less profitable, grow, it'll stay small, meaning finding a trade route that can theoretically bring in a large amount of resources can be a very good thing, and uh, you can set up some quite beneficial things, like you might be able to buy steel from the Americans and use that to make weapons if you're Belgium. We're using Belgium as an example here because Belgium does not have the largest amount of resources as well as a very limited amount of convoys because you have very few ports, meaning building up your port supply as a small nation is very important. So this is all well and good talking about how a market works, how import and export works, and just be aware that you're going to want to keep an eye on import and export on your own monitoring it. Sometimes it does not show up here, considerable import demand or export. Um, and it will also recommend more and more goods, even if you do not per se have convoys to support it. So just keep an eye on that. If you start running across the notification up here, you don't have enough convoys, you either should either consider changing the route or building more convoys. Um, suffice to say, usually it's not a problem for a large nation like Great Britain or even France, because you have lots of ports. But if you're a tiny nation, uh, having enough convoys is extraordinarily important. Okay, let's talk about altering the supply in our market. So the easiest way to do that, and for example, if we need lead, is to build a lead mine to produce it. Now, at the start of the game here, lead is not required anywhere. No one wants to buy or sell it, meaning building this mine or this resource is entirely pointless. But if we were to wander over here and look at iron mines, you will see that iron is expensive. People want to buy more iron than they are selling. Okay, that means if we upgrade this, theoretically, we will be selling more iron, the price of iron will fall, and we can then use that iron to build other stuff. Now, the downside is, as it tells you right here, predicted earnings per week would be negative, mainly because if we build this building, we will flood the market with more. Whoops, sorry, my cat is lying on my keyboard. Hi, Rose. Um, she messed everything up. Uh, suffice to say, sometimes you don't want to over flood a market because you want all your buildings to remain productive. If you build too many, it will become unproductive. However, if it becomes unproductive, they'll hire less people, wages and stuff will fall. So it's not always a bad thing to expand a building because if for some reason you're going to start demanding more iron later on in a factory, it's better to have a already made supply rather than having to do trade routes. Now you can obviously do trade routes to solve a shortfall, but being self-sufficient is very important. So building resources will change the base cost of a resource, um, and it will theoretically lower the price of that resource to be used in your factories. So if we wander up here to tool workshops, actually, let's go to steel mills first. So the steel mills here take in iron, and right now iron is slightly more expensive, and they also take in coal, which is a tiny bit more expensive. So what this means is this building's import Import, input, sorry, input prices are more expensive than they have to be. Meaning if the building is losing money, that could be the culprit. The other culprit, of course, is the selling price. In this case, iron and coal are expensive, but so is steel. Meaning this building is making money because it buys stuff, even though it's more expensive, it's covered by how much we can sell of it. And that is quite important for a building and it's something you want to keep an eye on. Now, what happens if we try and use the steel in something? So if we go to look at our um, tooling workshop, the tooling workshop is now buying steel and the steel is expensive, but it's also buying wood and wood is cheap. And then it's making tools, which are right at this point are extraordinarily expensive, meaning making more tools will be helpful especially if we wander away to somewhere else here and we look at uh, furniture. So in terms of this furniture factory, here comes those tools priced again at the market now into our furniture manufacturing. So if for some reason our iron mine, or we don't have enough iron, the iron price will spike. 
making the iron mine potentially profitable. But then the steel factory, which we looked at, now its import input is going to rise. It's going to it's going to not be as pro productive because now it's going to have to spend more money buying iron. And it was already right on the line. It was only making like seven hundred um, a month. If that falls. That building might become unprofitable, close down, fire employees, which would then mean that steel in our market price is going to go up and it might reopen the factory, might not, meaning then our tools will become more expensive. And if our tools become more expensive, our furniture may become more expensive. So if you have a problem in something like a furniture manufacturer, which uses, in this case, hardwoods, wood, tools, as well as fabric, it might not be a simple matter of, well, we're not selling furniture at a good price. Could be the import. The input is too expensive. This means trying to build a supply chain is extraordinarily important. Um, this is the era in which, if you're an American, you'll know that uh, monopolies started to develop. And why did the monopolies develop? Well, there's a reason monopolies in a market develop, usually because a monopoly, depending on the being a horizontal or vertical monopoly tends to control all production of a resource. If it's a vertical monopoly, say standard oil, which exists in the US, it did everything from drilling the oil to right up to selling the oil um, once it was fully processed, moved and everything else. And as a result, most of their supply chain could lose money, the production, the refinery, the shipping, but the selling is where they would make money and it would finance the whole enterprise. Now, this kind of occurs in Victoria 3, and not to get super in-depth, it is a good idea to keep an eye on your full supply chain, and thankfully, you get the notifications when a good gets expensive, there'll be a new notification in input good is expensive. Keep an eye on that, it's very important. What you want to do is make sure that if you're building furnitures and you're using advanced techniques, for example, if we lower these, we could use less resources. Um, if we were to drop it to handcraft, we'd significantly decrease the amount of uh, goods we might be using. Um, where was I going with this? Ah, yes. If you're going to build an advanced factory, it either it behooves you to either be producing all of those lower resources in your land or have an easy supply bought from abroad in order to make that factory productive. Now, furniture is a good example because furniture is not a required, like, essential resource in your nation. Yes, it's used for standard of living, but it's not like you like guns, which you need to actually fight and win wars. So let's talk about arms. So our arms industry here, right, we're, we've got it going. It's not making any money. So that means cash reserves are going to fall, then employment, and then it might shut down until it becomes profitable again. This could be a problem if we need those guns to support our armies to fight wars. And in fact, as Belgium, you might be under threat from the Dutch. We can, however, subsidize them. And subsidization, of course, can be done as well as building based off your various laws and everything else. This means the state will cover the wages of this building. So if we process forward a bit, Oh, it's actually not making any money at all, but this will mean that the workforce is at least fully maintained and the cash reserves, well, they're not doing as hot as they could be. Let's just put it that way. But it's no longer a complete crisis for this building, but this cost of us maintaining the full employment is going up as well as supporting the buying the goods, meaning the iron is right now crippling this building. If we solved our iron shortfall, it would flow through and potentially solve our arms as well as adjusting other prices. If this is overwhelming, suffice to say, if you're having a problem at the end of your factory, either you're producing way too much of an end good and you're not exporting it, or your resources input is a problem. Now, our arms, on the other hand, we're producing a lot of. If we were to try it, well, theoretically, we could be producing a lot of. If we go to our arms, right now, arms on our market is cheap. We could set up an export route to, say, the Spanish, right? So if we are to process forward a little bit, obviously, it takes time to adjust everything. Um, oh, whatever, ignore that. Uh, you'll see the weekly balance has now changed because the price of small arms in our lands is now expensive, meaning 
if you look at the market price, it spiked as soon as we started exporting it to the Spanish. We can also do this again with uh, artillery here. Um, let's see, artillery. Uh, artillery. At new export route, we'll say to the Spanish again. For some reason, the Spanish are short on uh, arms. Now, if we process, all of a sudden, this building is making money. That is an example of how to solve a productivity issue. Now, we're producing arms at such a level we could theoretically expand the building. Not that I would recommend it in this case. But this means in the event of a war or us needing to raise our army, where we have to suddenly buy a lot of arms and artillery, at least we have a building in place to make money. And while the building is making money, we don't have to pay the subsidies. So the subsidies can be put in place in advance in the case that at some point your supply chain breaks down a little bit, but you still need an essential industry. I honestly, if you're producing guns, it is almost 100% worth subsidizing your iron mines because you're going to need a lot of iron. Now, most of the time, basic resource buildings always make money, but this would protect you against a sudden market flood of an external uh, country suddenly sending you a lot of steel. Going to the Qing example I used earlier, if all of a sudden you somebody floods you with a ton of grain, not that we're going to use grain too many places, um, other than, say, food industry here, while the decreased price will make this building way more profitable, it will hurt your farms. You can always, of course, adjust it if you go to the market and you can change tariffs. Be aware, though, and we've talked about a lot, that depending on your trade policy, this allows you to protect trade. This one balances out import-exports, and you can greater change on protecting supply or exporting. But if you get to free trade, you can't put any tariffs on any goods. On the other hand, your trade routes are more competitive and they cost less to build and they trade more. Isolationism, you totally cut off. Uh, Shogunate Japan starts with this. They have to build all of this stuff and balance their market internally, which is difficult because they don't have access to all the resources they need, meaning the prices can be constrained and their economy looks really weird if at some point they shift from isolationism to say free trade they might find out their entire economy is totally unprofitable outside of selling uh, it in japan and that's just a long-term thing while i will say this market does not accurately say reflect the real world it's a decent job and you should keep an eye on all of your stuff so to review since we're at the end here pretty much the basics are every good is produced, it's sold in a market, or it's sold in another market if you export it or import it from the other ones, which changes the prices in both markets. Since we're selling goods on the Spanish market, we're selling uh, guns and artillery. Guns and artillery just got a lot less expensive in the Spanish market, hurting any arms industry they might be building, but they're now more expensive in ours, meaning our building is now more productive. Markets are a good thing. Joining someone else's market can give you access to their resources uh, as well as their breakpoints, which might not be the worst thing in the world. On the other hand, it makes you a subject of them. But if you do a trade agreement, you gain access to their market through trade routes, import and export without tariffs, which can be very handy for small nations or uh, large nations that need to import a lot of good. Not paying a tariff can save you a lot of money. Further on, Reviewing import export is very important. Thankfully, Paradox has provided us goods with considerable demand. Obviously, iron has now changed since we are selling more iron, since we're making it into artillery and guns, meaning we either need to import iron or it's going to cause supply problems or expand our iron mines in Wallonia. On the other hand, this goods with considerable export doesn't always necessarily reflect what you may want to sell. It just says, hey, this is super cheap. You might make money if you're selling it elsewhere. It does not, did not show that our arms industry could be made money selling elsewhere, even though the reality is selling those guns and artillery will, in the long run, make us more money. So just be aware that as good as the considerable import is, the considerable export I find not as good. Also, your current 
situation will remind you if, for example, you have an unproductive trade route. We can go up here and we can just simply cancel this. By and large, unless you're in, actually, the reality is you never want an unproductive trade route. Um, unless, you know, suddenly uh, something's going to change, like you're opening a new factory. Now, if you automate all your buildings, which you consider doing, they will solve a good portion of your um, building issues. So if we are to do this, you'll see that the game has now said, hey, the iron mines are worth expanding. They're making money. Expanding it will potentially make us more money, even though the game's telling us the predicted, predicted earnings will fall. The reality is, once we build it, you'll probably find it actually makes money. Um, the game, of course, has its settings to manage cash reserves, market access, etc. Um, cash reserves, if they're up, the building's doing well. If they're going down, the building isn't doing well. It's a very quick and easy way if you are to look at, uh, say here, we can look at it. Trade centers, not making much money. Food industries, not making money. But everything else is green or yellow. Green is if cash reserves are increasing, yellow if they're full. That's a sign that you might potentially want to expand it. Red is a problem, so keep an eye on your lands. If you find red, investigate, especially if you're a small nation, or let the market eventually correct the problem, which it will. Eventually, this steel mill may in fact shut down because steel is no longer as valuable as it once was, or else, in this case, iron is super expensive. And anyway, hopefully that will give you guys a slightly better understanding of all the market systems in this game. They're very complex, and certain goods are obviously more in demand, but basic resources usually can be sold somewhere. Just be aware that if you start building, say, lead mines and you have no demand for lead and you're not going to export it, your lead mines will never make money. On the other hand, if you're going to eventually use lead, it might be worth investing ahead of time so that when lead starts being used in large quantities as tech goes on, you'll be in a position to dominate the lead market. There's quite an advanced amounts of strategy here, and I'm sure people will figure out tons and tons of exploits. Certain goods are always going to be more in demand if you're British and stuff. Well, suffice to say, the British capitalists tend to have demands for certain resources, and depending on your culture, they might have an obsession or a taboo. The British is tea. <laughs> uh, and I think coffee as well. Whereas the Flemish, uh, the Dutch and everything, they're, they're, they're pretty normal. They don't have any great overwhelming demands. China, on the other hand, loves opium, meaning Building opium mines and selling it in China might be an extraordinarily profitable thing to do. And anyway, that will be it for this guide. I could keep going on this topic, but I think you've covered it enough. If you guys have any questions, leave them below. If you have any comments or recommendations about how the guide went or anything else, let me know. And uh, like, subscribe if you haven't done so and it helped you. And I will see you guys all in another guide or a Let's Play or a live stream. Bye for now.